I took each team's total targets in their offense from last season, tracked the number of targets that left that offense and the number of targets that came in, and then used that data to create a target delta. Using that delta, I calculated the total projected targets I have for each player this upcoming season. Now, before we get too deep into this, let's talk about some quick rules that'll kind of help you consume this a little bit easier. A wide receiver getting over 140 targets is a certified wide receiver one, right? And then if they get up to 170 or anywhere near it, they're like in that elite of elite range. We're talking about Justin Jefferson, you know, CD Lamb, Tyreek. That's the level of wide like game breaking wide receivers get to 170. But as long as you're getting 140, you're a solid wide receiver one. Now, getting over 120 means you're like kind of a wide receiver two plus, right? Depending on how you use, how many TDs you get in the season, you know, the depth of your targets, those can push you up closer to wide receiver one. But for the most part, like, you're a high end two, low end one is, is at around the 120 mark. More likely the high end two. Over 100 targets is you're kind of that two, three, depending on efficiency and TDs. And then sub 100 targets, you're wide receiver three or worse. Below 70 targets, you're, you know, nothing more than a wide receiver four probably more like a five for tight ends over 120 targets is the set and forget it tight end one you know he's not coming out of your lineup you're going to play him every week you don't have to worry too much tight ends around 100 targets can work well with high efficiency think about someone like dallas goddard right he's always going to get there as like kind of a startable tight end because of that efficiency and then anywhere under 90 targets is a low end one high end two you know Start him, sit him based on the matchup, all stuff like that. For running backs, any running back with over 80 targets is usually a bell cow. 70 with efficiency can be a premium one. Think about someone like Gibbs. But for the most part, running backs under 80 targets come down to total volume and efficiency. More targets is obviously a plus, and they can be used to find some undervalued players in PPR. But for the most part, the targets aren't too, you know, impressive for anything under 80 right it more so comes down to those rushing attempts and total volume than target specifically which is why in this video we're going to be talking a lot more about wide receivers than running backs specifically let's get into it now before we get into those late round sleepers that are really going to make you your money in fantasy let's talk about some players in the first two rounds that look very promising now while targets aren't everything they're a lot more correlated to fantasy football success than something like touchdowns which can be a lot more volatile from season to season so the first player first player off the board based off underdog ADP, it's going to be Amon Ra. Now, Amon Ra typically goes as the sixth player off the board in underdog after both Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson. And while I don't think that's necessarily wrong, I'd much rather be at the sixth spot and get Jefferson or Amon Ra based off the targets they expect to see this upcoming season. And Amon Ra gets a slight nod in this particular scenario because he has a better catch rate than Jay Jetta. So, you know, while I'd be happy with any of them, that's the, one of the few draft spots that I think if you're in a normal fantasy league and you can go to, to six or five, preferably five so you can guaranteed get either Jettas or Amon Ra, that's kind of your sweet spot this year in the first round, unless you're going back all the way to the late half, which we'll talk about Garrett Wilson. Garrett Wilson is absolutely my favorite first round pick. If you get a late first in your draft this year, just take Garrett Wilson. It's really that simple. He's going to be... he's almost certified to get 150, 160 targets. And I don't see him like being short on TDs or anything. Like it, he is the perfect late round wide receiver. I personally think he's going to be this year's CD lamb, like that elite wide receiver that you could take in the back half of the first round. And then he just explodes. And he's this elite player that you can count on week in week out during this season. Next up in the second round, really love Drake London. I mean, another player that should be looking at 160 targets, some of the players around him are not going to be seeing that at all. Like, let's talk about Marvin Harrison. This is one of the few players that I just don't like drafting this year. And I love Marv. Like, it it just comes down to people are expecting this Cardinals offense to be throwing the ball like they were when Kingsbury was the OC. Last season, between Dobbs and Kyler, there was no at all increase in passing attempts when Kyler was back. Now, you could say, well... Maybe he was still linked from hurt. They didn't want to push him too hard. Whatever you think, this offense is not going to be throwing the ball a crazy number of times per game. It's just not what they're looking to do. And while Marv is an amazing player that I love to have in Dynasty, 
rookie year, I'm not expecting Puka Nakua out of him. Like, that's just not going to happen. I think he's certainly, he'll get 100 targets. He's just not going to hit the 150 that I expect to see from, like, Drake London, Garrett Wilson, even Chris Olave, I think, should have more targets than him this season. Which is a good segue because Chris Olave is another player that I'm not in love with, but he's another solid target, especially in these first two rounds. Quite on par there with Devontae Adams. Nothing wrong against players like, you know, Saquon or Ayuk. It's just, especially Ayuk, like, Ayuk is going to be looking at, like, 100 targets. I would much rather have Devontae Adams with 140, Chris Olave with 140, Drake London with 155, than Ayuk with 100. That's just the way I play. I think in the first two rounds, you want stability. You take all of that upside in the later rounds when it there's no risk. Like, I don't know. That's another conversation for another day. It's like, unless Ayuk actually does end up on the Commanders, in which case he would see that bump in targets, on the Niners, Ayuk is just not going to win you your fantasy league. At least not alone. Like, he's not a CMC. So that's the main issue here. In terms of some other players, Debo's interesting at his current ADP, which is around pick 21. Because if you draft him now and Ayuk does get traded, he's in a great spot with about, like, 100-plus targets and his utility as a runner. A player that I think is a lot safer, though, would be Mike Evans. Now, earlier in this offseason, I wasn't too big a fan of Mike Evans, just because, you know, it seemed like a lot of bet on TDs. But considering the other players around him, he's not too bad of a bet. Let's give ahead to someone that's a little bit deeper. Michael Pittman Jr. Now, Pittman got 150 targets last year. And he's being drafted next to people like Zay Flowers, who got 100. Travis Kelsey got 120, obviously as a tight end. Stefan Diggs is there, but Stefan Diggs has severely improved target competition this season. I mean, Pittman is a lock for 130, 140 targets. He's going at pick 33. And he's not a player that's going to be too held back by Anthony Richardson. In fact, I think Richardson actually might, you know, increase in a positive sense Laporta's TD volatility. If, you know... AR comes out the pocket, gets on the run, defense breaks down, and he can just, he has an arm. If he can hit Pittman deep a couple of times this season for, like, a long catch, like, what are we even talking about here? With the target rate that he's going to be getting, it's it's going to be ridiculous. Don't want to spend too much time on any one single player. One interesting player that is not a target by any means, but I think it's just something that we do have to break down here is George Pickens. Now, the issue with George Pickens is that he'd need great efficiency in an offense that doesn't look poised to be uber efficient. In A.J. Brown's breakout year, he had 106 targets, 70 receptions, 15.4 yards per reception, 10 TDs. Pickens last year had 106 targets, 7 less receptions at 63, a better yards per reception at 18.1, and 5 touchdowns. Now, five more TDs would have made him the wide receiver 16 instead of 30. Will those TDs happen this year is the ultimate question. And looking at the data, I mean, it's hard not to improve from Kenny Pickett and what we saw last year. Who knows if it was actually Pickett's fault? Maybe it was Matt Canada. You know, Pickett got the bad end of the stick. Who knows? Regardless, we're going to see some increased TDs. Now, not all of those are going to go to George Pickens, obviously. But I do think there's... A decent, you know, spot here where you're drafting Pickens at pick 40, and he offers a slight bit of upside. But personally, an underdog, I just can't really get super behind it. I think if you're like Pickens has to be your second or third wide receiver. He can't be the first wide receiver you're taking off the board, or you're kind of like shooting yourself in the foot a little bit. In best ball, it's a little bit better. It's just he's a he's a conundrum. If Pickens were maybe getting drafted five, seven spots later, I'd probably be all over him. But right now, 40 is kind of a, a tough price to, to swallow. In terms of some of the next targets, let's get into the people that I really like as we get later into this draft. Jackson, Smith, and Jigba. JSN is going to be looking at around 110, 113, 115, maybe 120, but I wouldn't expect 120 targets. Respectfully, probably 115 targets. Not many receivers left on the board in his range at round pick 78. 
are really sniffing that. He's getting about 20 more targets than the other receivers that are going off the board in here. Now, obviously, people are still very cautious about Jan's, you know, poor rookie season. But I really think context has to be added to this. Tyler Lockett is still a very good wide receiver. He's honestly another player that I really like in most drafts. JSN was getting drafted a little too high for a rookie receiver coming into a heavily competitive wide receiver room. Now, while that competition has not changed, second-year breakout wide receivers are kind of where you want to bet your money on, especially when they have a target share like JSN will. Even better in best ball, we know that this group, at least individually, may be somewhat up and down, right? Like, there may be a week where Tyler Lockett has an amazing game, JSN gets limited to two points. But then the next week, JSN pops off for 20 and Lockett's looking at three. The reality is in best ball, that's the kind of player you want late in your drafts. The rising tide of the targets in this offense are going to keep them all afloat as valuable fantasy options, especially in best ball. Now in your regular leagues, JSN may not be amazing because of that inconsistency, but you're kind of fine taking some variance the later we get into these rounds player that i absolutely love evan ingram i genuinely do not understand why he's being drafted this late an underdog he's going right next to jsn pick 78 79 and he's getting 140 targets that's what i expect like he got 140 last year like is is brian thomas really gonna push for 120 targets no he's Brian Thomas, in reality, is going to be like Mike Williams was in the Chargers offense. That's what I kind of expect. That can provide value in fantasy football, but it's not a massive threat to what Ingram is doing week in, week out in terms of targets. And the reality is, is there is no tight end even close to what Ingram is doing target-wise this year. I mean, maybe you can see it from Pitts, but you're also drafting Pitts a lot higher. Even Kelsey. Kelsey's obviously going to be much more efficient from a touchdown perspective because of how, you know, amazing the Chiefs offense is. But like Ingram is probably going to be the leading tight end target guy again this year. And you can get him at pick 78, like sign me up for that every single day of the week. Now let's, let's talk about someone who I'm absolutely just grossed out by. Curtis Samuel at pick 92. I really don't understand why people think Curtis Samuel is going to be this great threat in the Bills offense. This could also be looped in as kind of some, you know, putting out the fire a little bit on Keon Coleman as well. Although Keon Coleman, I can't expect, he's a little overvalued, but it won't be as bad as I expect of Curtis Samuel. In my eyes, Curtis Samuel's getting like 50 targets this year. That's just the reality of it. The Bills don't throw that much. And when they do, it's going to go to Kincaid and Coleman. That's the reality. Curtis Samuel is going to look at like 55 targets this year. That's just straight up what's going to happen. Like, I get it. He had 90 targets last year in an offense that threw the ball a lot. The Bills do not do that. And Curtis Samuel is over the hill. Like, I think we got to wake up a little bit with that. Tyler Lockett mentioned before, I love him. He's going to be looking at like 110 Targets at pick 98, like, that's amazing. David Njoku, pretty decent. Uh, Dontavian Wicks is another guy. I'm just, I can't get behind it. I mean, my original thought before I did all this analysis was, hey, Green Bay is probably a good room to bet on because any week one of them can pop off. At pick 120, yeah, Dontavian Wicks is solid because I know on one random week, Maybe he puts up two TDs and he gives me a lot of value. But Dontavian Wicks is going to be like a 60-65 target player. That's just the reality. And you're drafting him next to someone like Mike Williams, who's going to be getting 85 targets and have that same touchdown potential in the Jets' offense. You're drafting him around someone like Austin Eckler, who might get, I don't know, let's say 60-70 targets as a running back. You're drafting him before someone like Jahan Dotson, who now in a Cliff Kingsbury offense can push for over 100 targets based on how often they're going to throw the ball. I really just, 
Dontavian Wicks, for how limited his target share is, is way too pricey for me. Another player, let's talk about someone we love now, TJ Hawkinson. Now, this is contingent on if he plays, you know, a decent enough bit of the season. If he misses like two, three games, especially in your regular leagues, I'm always taking the player that's missing two, three games at the start of the season and is going to be with me the rest of the way. Now, while I am concerned about, you know, the quarterback play potentially in this Vikings offense, the quarterback play was not good last year, okay? And while Justin Jefferson was not there, I really don't think, you know, I think there's enough share for them to do everything. If anything, I think Addison is the one that maybe takes a decent bit of a hit. But, like, Hawkinson, especially being a safety valve for whatever quarterback is in there, is going to be great. His targets will decline from the 127 we saw last year, but I don't see it dipping beneath, you know, 100. And I think if you can get a 100 target tight end at this spot, you know, that's great stuff at 145. Roman Wilson, you won't see me drafting any of him. Um, I do see Adam Thielen right next to him. Could have talked about Deontay earlier. I think in underdog, you know, betting on any of the Carolina receivers is somewhat valuable simply because nobody has any idea how the target's going to shake out, right? It's going to be very hard to predict how Xavier Worthy, uh, Xavier Leggett and uh, Deontay Johnson eat into Thielen's like 2023 monopoly on targets in the offense. So, you know, we always set to... We always say to bet on the murky running back rooms. And this might be the murkiest wide receiver room in the NFL. So I don't hate you kind of rolling the dice on any of them if you don't like the players that are around them when you're up on the clock. One really deep sleeper, if you're in like a very deep league, Elijah Moore. I think, I mean, I think there's a chance Elijah Moore gets 80 targets. Those targets may not be super great. Like they'll be probably pretty close to the line of scrimmage. I don't think he's going to be like a TD machine. But an 80-target receiver, when you're getting him next to, like, Khalif Raymond, who's going to be getting, like, 40 targets, Jalen Tolbert, 40 targets, Tyler Boyd, probably, like, 50 targets this year on the Titans. I don't hate it if you're in that deep. Most most people won't have to draft a receiver that deep in here, but kind of fine with it. And then we'll talk about one more great guy before we get off here, Marvin Mims. Now, his initial target opportunity is not great, right? Like, I expect probably, like, 58, 60 targets for Mims this year, which was kind of honestly hard to come to, come to terms with as someone who really loved Mims coming out of the draft, seeing that little bit of spark early and then just nothing the rest of the year. But while that initial target opportunity is pretty, you know, bitter, Sutton has never been the picture of health in this league. And on top of that, he also does want a new contract. Now, Sutton to me does not seem like the player who will sit out. You know, I expect him to play. But the reality is, is there's a chance, you know, I don't know. You don't know. Sutton has never been super healthy. He might be like, screw it. Give me a new deal or I'm not going to play. There's that option. And there's him potentially getting hurt again. Either one of those gives Marvin Mims a massive boost in value. And at pick 177, that's the dice roll you got to take. That's late. I will have the link down to this spreadsheet below if you want to just scroll through it, kind of get my thoughts, my notes, everything like that. Hope you enjoyed the video and have a good one. Peace.